Hello and welcome to episode 23 of the James Smith Podcast. Today is a solo episode. Now, Fair Points will be coming out later this week. We did have a weekend off. Sunny's been incredibly busy um, and we've just been having a wholesome weekend really. So I thought I'd use this opportunity to have a little catch up with everyone, talk about a few topics. Um, I haven't really done a solo podcast in a few weeks, so I thought this would be good. Number one on the agenda, tour announcement went out for Australia and the UK. Um, we had to do a shift in dates. So there's every chance that if I leave Australia at this point, I will not get back in. Um, even Australians themselves are banned from leaving Australia until December. So the likeliness of me going home, being able to come back, was slim. So we've now done it. So the Australia tour is going to happen first. Then I'm going to come back to, uh, to the UK. Really looking forward to that. Um, we sold out the tram shed in Cardiff. And I'm pretty sure... Well, actually, no, we, we sold out the Roundhouse in London, which is crazy. Now, what we're doing at the moment is getting a different or trying to get a different seating pattern for that so we can get some more tickets on sale. Thank you very much to everyone uh, who's bought those so far. Now, I know a lot of people might not even know what the tour is about or what on earth is going on. Now, it's not me on stage just signing books. Oh, thank you for coming or anything like that. Um, the last tour was primarily kind of fitness chat, but it's not as you know it. And it's almost like a combination of, it's kind of found its way to be a bit of stand up whilst being informative at the same time. And for instance, to give you some context, the last tour, there were some talks where, when I did cover female fat loss, which was an element of book one, not a diet book, instead of going out there and explaining to the women about their menstrual cycle, I'd go out and explain it to the men. And I'd be jovial with it. I'd have some fun. We'd break things down. Uh, we'd have a pop at some of the kind of things in the fitness industry. Um, so that it was a laugh. But at the same time, if someone hadn't finished the book at that point, or if someone had brought a friend along, it would give them quite a lot of insight into things, you know, that they need to know. Now, this tour upcoming for Not A Life Coach is as much about having a bit of an empowering talk and getting together and having a night out uh, as it is about really trying to instill a message across to people. And one of the best parts of, of having the talk is that a lot of people, hopefully, are going to pre-order the book and buy the book. And when they come to the show and hear what I talk about, if they haven't made it that far through the book already, it will hopefully incentivize them to uh, you know, carry on reading. I always joke about it at the live events and say to people, you know, it's like sending nudes before you slept with someone. Just keep them interested, keep them engaged, keep them on the same path. Uh, those of you that are watching on YouTube will see that I am chilling in my kitchen right now, on the kitchen side, having a coffee. Uh, so if Ben comes down as well, by the way, in this podcast, I can only apologize. So yeah, those uh, talks are going to be really interesting, really fun. Uh, we're going to New Zealand as well, which is pretty cool. I used to play rugby there a few years ago about nearly 10 years ago. And yeah, this kind of upcoming thing will be for those people that didn't want to come to a fitness chat and uh, spoken about this quite a lot before. Now, I appreciate there are a lot of people that probably follow me that don't need a fitness book. And funnily enough, I was in talks with a CrossFitter probably in the last six, 12 months who had competed at literally the top level, games athlete, and although that person was a games athlete, they didn't have the confidence to even put out a product that people could buy from them. So I was always talking to this person and I was actually talking to this person when I was writing the book and I was thinking to myself, shit, this person could literally go up against some of the best athletes in the world and back themselves to potentially become the fittest person on earth. But when it came to monetizing their following or when it came to selling a product to their clientele they had no confidence and it's crazy that in some areas of people's lives you can be literally considered one of the best people in your field yet you move over to say business and your six pack isn't going to save you in that realm you know getting 15 or 20 muscle ups or doing you know whatever movement it is isn't going to benefit your business and there are so many gaps in people's knowledge and with the first book granted if you're in incredible shape and you understand the ins and outs of fitness, training, nutrition, whatever, I can understand why you might not want to come to that talk. But for these ones and for this second book, you know, you, you could be doing so well in one area of your life, but another area of your life might be letting you down. And it's why it's such a kind of great opportunity 
for me to write the second book because not everyone wants to talk about fitness chat and macronutrients and protein and shit like that. Not everyone needs to be on a diet and hopefully a lot of you will have resonated within the first talk and the first book about concepts like the sunk cost fallacy where human beings tend to remain invested in something not because it's benefiting them but because of the amount of time they've already invested into it now this could be a diet in a lot of cases it could be a relationship or a job and I know that uh, you know a lot of people when you ask them why are you still dating that person they say to themselves oh well you know we've been together this many years and you're like yeah you're, you're making a decision based off your previous investment which is a pretty dangerous way to go about things and when I look at that first book the things that really resonated in people was things like the sunk cost fallacy, which allowed a lot of people to break up with partners they didn't really want to be with. It allowed a lot of people to leave jobs that they weren't really stimulated in. And I'm eternally grateful for that. So for any of you that are like, you don't know what the second book is about, you don't know, you know, what's going to be at the talk. It's going to be kind of elements all like that, where there are a lot of conversations I want to have that aren't bound to the realm of fitness chat, which is why I think there's already so much popularity um, with both. But yeah, one of the kind of shitter parts of this is that I probably won't see my parents for about a year. Um, I was supposed to go home in April. Well, actually, no, I was going to go to America first, then come home. So I would have been home by about May. We're now in September. And although I love Australia, I love being here, one of the main reasons I decided, decided to stay here was for my mental health. And I, I'm i happiest here. Blue skies, good friends, chilled lifestyle. Um, but obviously have to have these awkward conversations I'm like yeah mum dad <laughs> might not see you for a year but it's all part of kind of protecting that bubble uh, in which I live in which again is uh, a really important thing that I think a lot of people struggle with where they're making decisions based off making other people happy and, and trust me when I say this if there was one set of people that I wanted to make happy above all else it'd be my family but yeah, I made that decision. It wasn't a light decision uh, to play. My sister is about to have her first child, so I'm about to be an uncle for the first time. And I won't be there probably to see the baby for the first few months, which is shit. But a bit like that kind of adage of when the plane's going down, you've got to put your oxygen mask on yourself first. And again, I don't think that many people really think about that. And they make decisions based off keeping other people happy and they leave themselves last, which is one of many kind of constituent issues of why mental health is probably, you know, a bigger problem now than it has been for a long time. And I did a, a post last night uh, on the stats about mental health and, and people saying, oh, you know, suicide is up 200%. And I went looking, I couldn't actually find any statistics to back that up. And actually what we find is with statistics on things like suicide there, you know, it, it takes a long time to collate data and studies. And we have data from 2018, we have some data from 2019, but having recent stats on, on 2020 is a little bit harder to, to put together just, just yet. And I think that statistic actually stems from the fact that a lot of helplines for mental health charities uh, have had their call inbound increase of up to about 200%, which is where I think that, that number skewed from. Now, as I put in a post yesterday, like we shouldn't, it, it shouldn't take an, a, a lift or an uptake in suicides for people to be like, oh God, have you seen seen this in the news? 200% increase in uh, you know suicides. Oh, we should do something about this. It was already too high before. And even looking at old statistics, men between the ages of 20 and 49, the single biggest killer is, is suicide. And you know, I don't want to put a dampener on the COVID situation, but you know, everyone's like, oh my God, there's, there's this disease that's spreading around the world. Yes, yeah, coronavirus 19. And you know, if you're over 80 years old, you know, you're at really high risk. And although there are younger people dying and I appreciate that, you know, oh, there's lots of people dying, but almost, why haven't we had this discussion come to the forefront where people go, yeah, we get that. We understand that. We shut down the economy for COVID. We stopped international flights. We locked people in countries. We locked people out of countries. Yeah the whole time and pre-COVID, the biggest killer of men between 20 and 49 was people killing themselves. You know, that, no, one, no one's like, right, we're gonna shut the country down. 
to uh, really work on why you know people are doing this and the statistic I use in men can sometimes make it seem that men are in a worse position and one thing I want to highlight is men aren't if you look at kind of attempted suicides the rates between men and women are actually very similar and uh, I use the statistic as a man speaking on behalf of, of men uh, but it turns out that women often can just use less um, effective means of attempting suicide um, which again is a, a horrendous statistic because they've tried something and you know if it doesn't work I, I can only kind of imagine what kind of position that would put someone in but yeah it, it's kind of a bit of frustration on my point because I've been trying to make mental health discussions be mainstream for a long time longer before COVID and you know this infectious disease that comes across the world, gets so much airtime, gets so much, uh, you know, attention and, and people are acting on behalf of it so much. And I, I can't help but feel that it's almost like a political thing where politicians, number one, you know, they can be at risk. Number two, they're trying to be reelected or, you know, they're trying to have their political party come out on top. And even the politics in Australia right now of seeing all the different states kind of you know lock their borders and others and you know victoria's gone down the pan and uh you know queensland shut their border to sydney siders and part of me does often think that people are just trying to protect their own skin um and like i say i'm not playing down the severity of a, a disease that's killed hundreds of thousands but again on the same you know respect it'd be very interesting after all of this when we probably do get the suicide stats that are accurate to see how many deaths were attributed to COVID that weren't actually COVID related deaths. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm not saying this as someone in a position, you know, I'm not a scientist, I'm not a doctor, but I'm just someone who's experienced in this like everyone else. And I'm like, hold on a second, if someone has a heart attack and they had COVID, it's being reported as a COVID death. And, you know, it, it's one of those things that I feel like mental health has just not only been parked to the side, it's been something that's been completely overlooked. and now we're seeing rates of young healthy adults who aren't immune compromised and you know who may be making every effort to not spread the disease suddenly be stuck at home out of a job or whatever it is and you know potentially end their own lives and it's almost like a contradictive approach that we've seen from the governments uh, around the world so i mean we got in the uk the anti-obesity campaign which was within the same month of this eat out regime where you know, people potentially were getting 50% off McDonald's. The, you know, the government come out, they're like, right, you know, we're going to help tackle obesity. We're going to help people lose fat. You know, okay, cool. Yes, yeah, we, um, by the way, 50% off McDonald's. Excellent. Contradictive. And again, you know, we're seeing politicians now, you know, oh, guys, we're going to stop the spread. You know, we're going to work together. We're going to wear masks. We're going to do this. And I'm kind of like, but what about the, the thousands of people, you know, the already that were taking their own lives? What about the people that, you know, are going to do it now but not only that i don't like that mental health is kind of quantified in in just deaths because such a large percentage of people just struggle and you know they are just going through life unhappy and what those people can't be accounted for unless they kill themselves i think that's a, a false way to even um you know quantify it in the first place not to mention that all these initiatives there to you know help businesses and to help you know restaurants and you know hotels you know these hotel forced quarantines are um, in my opinion just as much to support you know the the holiday and hotel industry as anything else but yeah where where are the discounts for therapy for you know call centers you know for counselors or whatever it is it seems that so much effort has been put into one scene to protect politicians and so much has been neglected from that side um and you know it's something that it's funny because I sometimes don't even like to talk about any like work that I do with mental health charities because we live in this world now where people are like, you know, you give money to a homeless person, cool. Lad Bible do a piece about a guy who, you know, goes out of his way and is like a philanthropist doing this. People are like, why do you have to record it? And now like you even mentioned like donating to charities and people are like, oh yeah, what, you can't do it without even telling everyone about it. What's the point? And you're like, fuck off. You know, it's it's pretty annoying, but... I was, not only do I do that, I kind of 
keep my ear to the ground about it. And Gen uh, Z have suffered the most in terms of mental health. According to research by University College of London, young people have reported the lowest levels of life satisfaction during the pandemic, which is pretty fucked. Now, for some of you that may not know what Gen Z is, um, I actually found a great picture depicting it uh, earlier on, which I'm just going to get up now on my laptop. And uh, millennials are almost to the left and Generation Z are to the right. Now, the easiest way to kind of uh, depict Generation Z is the group were born after the millennials. Uh, so I'm technically a millennial, uh, although I kind of feel like that, that uh, terminology comes with a bit of a stigma. So if you're born between 1980 and 1996, you're a millennial. So I was 89, something that. Uh, Generation Z between 1997 and 2010. Now, uh, it's quite interesting that millennials, we grew up during an economic boom and Generation Z grew up during uh, a recession. Uh, millennials tend to be idealistic and Generation Z tend to be more pragmatic. Uh, millennials are focused on having experiences and Generation Z are focused on saving money. So even the time we're born is having a big impact here. You know, um, Millennials prefer brands that share their values and Gen Z prefer brands that feel authentic. Millennials prefer Facebook and Instagram. Gen Z prefer Snapchat and Instagram. So, you know, it, we are different. And, and when we are born is a big key player in, uh, you know, how well we're going to do and what opportunities are going to arise for us. And if you look at uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, um, they're born all within, I think, you know, all the people that did very well within that kind of tech boom were all born in very close years to each other. Because if you look at Steve Jobs, who... Uh, one of the richest men in the world. If he was a few years younger, he wouldn't have been at university when the first computer was kind of, you know, available to be used. And if he was that a little bit older, he would have already left university and got into the workforce when that first computer was there. So there is a huge amount of luck as to where we are and how old we are. If I look at myself, a lot of the kind of good things that I could look at as far as my age, when I came to Australia at 27, you know, as video content was kind of taking off, I was old enough to understand how to run a business, but young enough to not be past it and pop out a couple of kids. So timing is uh, a lot to do with a lot of successes and, and things that we happen in life. So it's very interesting to think that the generation below mine are currently not as happy as, as the generation that I live in, the millennials. Um, and what I think is a big con contributing factor to that is that these people have done the right things you know, go to college or go to school, get good grades, go to college, get good grades, go to university, and then bang, there's like a recession or, you know, there's a fucking pandemic that goes on. And I think that if there's a life lesson that people can learn from this, it's that you can do all the things right in life and things can still go wrong. And I mean, right now, you could be like a great architect, but people aren't building houses as much as they were. You know, you could be a great, you know, lawyer or whatever it is. And so many people might have done what their parents wanted them to do. And again, if we look at the differences between Gen Z and, and millennials and how different their lives are, think about how different the lives are between us and our parents, where there's several generations almost that could slot in between that as far as generations. Um, and to share their values, this is a big part of not a life coach, is potentially setting yourself up to fail because the world was a very different place then than it is now. Although your parents might want you to save up and get a mortgage, which in their day might have been the best thing to do. If you grew up in my time as a millennial, maybe traveling the world was something that you did, you know, and we're very different. And that's the important thing we need to look at. And even someone who's five years older than you could share very different values to you because the world they were brought up into, although very much the same, is very much different. And when looking at, you know, mental health, it's, it's not like ageist. You know, it's not like, oh, you know, you're, you're 40 and you haven't accomplished anything. You only get depressed then. This depression is occurring in people younger than a lot of us. And I say that because I know the average age of my kind of following. But, you know, we've got to keep an eye on 18, 19 year olds, 20 year olds who so far, you know, might where their life was supposed to take off and get great. They had travel bans and unemployment and, you know, recessions and all of these things. So, yeah, it's, it's a really kind of interesting thing we need to look into and, and certainly learn more about. Now what do we do then which again which was like a big part of, of not a life coach and, and people talk about motivation and purpose and even existential crisis and, and one thing that I've always kind of thought to myself is we need to understand 
how something motivates us. And again, we have intrinsic motivation. So I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu because I like it. I don't need to be paid to do it. Uh, you know, there are certain things that I like to do because I like doing them and they make me happy. Then we have extrinsic motivators, which are things that often, you know, are going to get us reward, gratification, or, you know, even in some, or money, for instance. Now, I do my job and my work, even this podcast, for intrinsic motivation. I'm enjoying talking about this, recording this. I'm going to enjoy editing it. I'm going to enjoy posting it. Um, if you do something purely for extrinsic motivation, just for the money, so, you know, I worked in recruitment once and my friend said to me, you're going to hate it, but you get paid well. I thought, how on earth can I hate something if I'm getting paid well? Didn't even last a year. It's completely right. And what we find as well is that if people spend their life and their, especially their professional life doing things that only extrinsically motivate them just for money, just for recognition or whatever it is, they will end up with this sense of kind of anxiety and depression because they, they're not getting fulfillment from that. So, you know, we, we bringing up these generations, we've got our own, the one before us, the next one, you know, for anyone that's going to have kids in the next few years, we need to ensure that people around us, family, friends, kids, close family or whatever are identifying what is motivating them whether it's intrinsic or extrinsic because this is really important I say to Ferris about this all the time I'm like questioning him about his work and his job I'm like do you enjoy it I'm like what are you doing it for you know there are a lot of people in Australia that are purely working because their visa and um, the visa means so much to them but even though Australia makes them happy they're, they're doing it for something else and I feel that if you work purely for a visa status you're going to end up pretty unhappy um, and these are things that we need to look at. And this is why it's so important to do the right thing, you know, straight out of college, you know, um, and to do things that, that we enjoy. Because ultimately, if you're doing a profession that intrinsically motivates you, it doesn't matter if you're getting paid less than the person that has one that's extrinsic. Cam, who I live with, makes tables and he enjoys making them, does it in his spare time. Uh, we've got a really nice coffee table here. And like, it's great to see that because. On the outside, if you had a lawyer and a carpenter, someone would go, oh, you want to be a lawyer? You're like, well, hold on a sec. If you're going to bring up kids to have two jobs, if he's going to be happy as a carpenter or potentially miserable as a lawyer being someone's bitch, you know, wearing a suit when he doesn't want to wear a suit, going to work for his big pay slips or whatever it is, which one of those two is going to be more likely to suffer with mental health? And again, I would always say probably the lawyer. You know, wearing a suit and a big pay slip isn't going to protect you from having a miserable existence. You know what I mean? So... It's quite an important subject to talk about now than ever because in this current climate of, you know, uncertainty, this is a perfect opportunity for people to realign themselves with something that they want to do. And like, I feel that a lot of people might look at what I do and go, oh, well, actually, you're, off. you're extrinsically motivated because you get really well paid and, you know, blah, 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 blah. But it's not, it's not really true. And... The reason you can tell that is for a start, uh, YouTube, this video, this, this podcast going on YouTube, I'm not really pushing it that much. I just like the video aspects. I like that someone, instead of putting it on a speaker, can put it on their TV. I've never really been mad about YouTube because to me, it's just got a load of people there that are going to post literally fucking anything to get views, to get paid. And like, if you're posting video content, it shouldn't just be about getting paid. Now, I think it's great that some people can, you know, do ridiculous things and make big coin from it, but... At the same time, that doesn't really excite me. If it did, I would do more on YouTube and the same with Facebook. Some of my Facebook videos get millions of views and I have proactively to this day decided to not monetize my Facebook. And Facebook messaged me every now and then. They're like, James, you can turn your ad account on. I'm like, nah, I'm like, it doesn't excite me. And they're like, oh, you get paid. But I don't want people to look at adverts during my videos. You know, that's something that personally to me that's not why I'm doing it I'm posting the video because I enjoy posting that video I enjoy people reacting to it I would rather people have that experience than me make fucking a few thousand pounds a month from fucking ads or whatever it is the same reason that I've never done a paid post because the idea of promoting someone else's product for money does not excite me I can identify that as an extrinsic motivator and although 20,000 pounds for a good grid post on the outside looks like a great deal. To me, I already identify it as extrinsic. I already identify it as something that isn't going to make me happy, so therefore I don't want to do it. And I know that even with that 20 grand in my bank account, you know, I'm already slipping. 
I'm already moving away from the things that make me happy. And I think that's one of the reasons that I am so happy. I don't want to stand here rehearsing, being like, all right, guys, for you guys wondering how my teeth stay so white or, hey, you know, here's this new protein bar. Oh my God, it tastes so good. These are things where I'm trading my happiness for money. That's what the extrinsic motivation realm is all about. And for me, in a, in a bid to protect my happiness, I'm not going to do that. And at the end of the day, being less happy with more money is something I don't want. And it's something that a lot of people that do my line of work end up doing. And yeah, I like to be very transparent about that fact that I don't do paid posts because I want to walk the walk of this this life where I'm only driven by intrinsic motivators. People go, do you ever get sick of repeating yourself day in, day out, day in, day out on your lives and your videos? And the answer is no, because when I do those videos, I actually enjoy it. I, if I was extrinsically motivated, I wouldn't have done it for so many years in a row. Um, so yeah, it's really important that people identify that. And if they do more things that intrinsically motivate them, and especially get paid enough to survive from it, you're going to have a much happier life than those that are doing things, giving up time, effort for money. Um, in this podcast, I also wanted to talk about a few kind of trends that I'm seeing change at the moment. And uh, one of them is about gaming and mental health. And I'm playing a lot of Call of Duty at the moment, I'm playing a lot of Warzone, and I love it. I think that sitting in your room on a video game, never been a better time stay inside, don't socialize, you know, stay away from other people. Gamers, I'm like, yes, this is me. This is, this is the pandemic for me, you know? Um, and me and my friends that play online, we talk about it and we're like, go into the pub, have a few, few pints, sit with your mates. Yeah, cool. I'm sitting in your room. We've all got headsets on. We're going into battle together. We're like, we're being tactic, like tacticians. We're being cunning, sly, all of these things. And people enjoy it. And Although there probably is, you know, gaming addiction. Again, I talk about this in, in Not Life Coach. Everyone has their own methodology of escapism from their life. And, you know, whether it's going to the pub, going for a walk, taking the dog out or playing games, let's not scrutinize or, or, or attach a stigma to that. There are too many stigmas attached to things anyway, like mental health discussions. But gaming shouldn't be one. Because if your boyfriend, partner, girlfriend, whoever, can sit on a console for a very reasonable amount of money, Warzone's free as well, and they can enjoy an hour where they can leave the world of pandemics, recessions, fucking masks or whatever, and just enjoy a few hours. We should be getting behind that. And where we see trends in the world of education now being screen-based, communication and meetings being more screen-based, you know, gaming being screen-based, if people are going in and enjoying it and taking something from it and having downtime, socializing, things like that, we need to change our perspective with that. And we should be supporting those around us, you know, as long as there's balance, which ultimately is going to be subjective to everyone, letting your partner play some games, if it's going to make him happy, great. <laughs> you know, if it's going to make her happy, let them do it. Um, and, you know, everyone's like, oh, but what about productivity? You know, you're just wasting time. You're not. Because if you're investing something that's going to improve your mood and take you out of situations uh, or, you know, a negative headspace or whatever it is, we should absolutely be behind that. Um, but, yeah. The uh, other kind of interesting things I found mooching around some study, studies this week um, is that cooking or cookery is up 28% um, on the four weeks ending the 11th of July versus the same period in 2019. So, you know, people are cooking more. Uh, we've actually started making more of an effort in this house here, in, in this kitchen. Um, and that's kind of cool. Uh, I think personally, I'm struggling to diet a bit. I've got two weeks left of my own academy challenge. Um, but I'm kind of buzzing that people are cooking. And, and even if, you know, yeah, we got the obese people, we got those who are in bad bits of health. But if there are a few people right now just walking around a couple of kgs over what they would usually be at, but they're socializing, gaming with friends, eating like at home, cooking with their kids, cooking with their loved ones, having barbecues, that's great. And I mean, in this house, we've had so, we haven't been out properly. We just sit in the house drinking beers and like, yeah, I get it. I can get behind the world wanting to get in shape and get control of it. But if you're at a healthy body fat percentage and you're only rocking a couple of kg over and you're cooking more and, you know, adjusting to life, then I think that's absolutely great. And it's it's really good to see cooking um, on the rise. I'm not much of a, a good cook, but, you know, we say struggling to diet. I think we just need to appreciate this just isn't a great time to do it. And it's not like, you know, we can't get too deflated about being a couple of kgs over because ultimately we're taking that little bit of happiness from our reflection where we look in the mirror and like oh yeah fucking hell, I look great and we're taking that happiness and putting it in social aspects where eating loads of food 
having lots of wine, things like that. And we need to understand that our world isn't based around just how we look with our tops off. And there are clusters of happiness in our life that we have to take from places and put them in others. And, you know, at the moment in the current climate, I see people taking their clusters of enjoyment from their self-esteem and the way they look and just putting them into social aspects. And I actually think that's great. Um, you know, when people diet, they take <laughs> a lot of happiness from their food, their diet, their social circles and put it into their physique. So it's quite nice to see that in return. Um, so yeah, another kind of positive statistic that I came across was that for children in the pandemic has led to a shift in career aspirations. And in the UK, there was a 43% increase in the number of children that want to be a doctor. And I think that's amazing. I think that's actually really great. I think there are going to be a lot of positives out of this. And as far as career aspirations as well, imagine if we could lead a generation post COVID and say, look guys, any fucking disease, uh, you know, can come around and really change the shape of the world and how we live life, et cetera, et cetera. So make sure the most important thing you do is to do a job you enjoy. Cool. Bang. Done. You know, uh, for some people it might be, you know, being on a building site for others it might be having that flexible life driving ubers whatever it is but yeah i think that's a really important thing that we need to really delve into career aspirations and make sure we're not you know forcing pieces of puzzle to fit where it doesn't belong which i think a lot of people do okay closing points fair points delay sorry about that sunny's been very busy we will get one out this week um one of the things that we were gonna uh talk about in that fair points was actually I was having this discussion with Ferris on the grass the other day and like it was about rationality and irrationality to do with sharks and it's quite an interesting topic at the moment where a lot of people when they swim in the sea they're worried about sharks a lot of people when they come to Australia they're worried about spiders sharks etc but statistically speaking for that to negate your health or you know put you in a bad place the, the stats are actually really low like really really low and we were trying to get the point across to Ferris where it can make us feel like every time we get in the ocean, we're at danger of shark attack. Every time we go to bed, we're at danger of a spider attack. But when you look at the statistics, I said to Ferris, it's much more dangerous that you're going to die when you jump on your skateboard. Or even if you get in a car, even if it's an Uber. Um, the same respect that with how many people that get in the sea, sharks are harmless. You know, yes, you know, a certain amount of them do kill people. But again, we, we don't look at cars and go, that is a people killer. We see it as a mode of transportation. But yeah, when we get in the sea, we see sharks. We're like, these kill people. But you're much more likely to die in a car accident. I know some people are like, yeah, but you know, cars are on land, sharks are in the sea. But the point I'm trying to make is this. There's such irrational kind of logic with things like that in the same respect at the other end of the spectrum. Talk about this in the new book. With the lottery, where people buy a ticket and they think they're going to win. And you're like, well, how can you be so irrational on one side where you think a shark's going to bite you when it's really, really not? And so irrational on the other side where you buy a lottery ticket where you're really not going to win, but you think you're going to win. People go, oh, no, you know, I just do it for charity. Well, if you did it for fucking charity, mate, you would have just given the money to charity, not some fucking cunt in the fucking Northwest getting five million pounds of it. And, you know, if people didn't think they were going to win, they wouldn't buy a ticket end of so you know we have these really crazy rationalities on both points and these are easily influenced by our surroundings and the same is happening right now with COVID-19 where I really do say to people like try not to read news or you know um, don't let media because oh, the media's got nothing to fucking talk about at the moment it's making things out to be worse I feel than they are a lot of the time and you know doom and gloom and recession all this kind of stuff and i think that we just need to keep that kind of irrationality out of our heads similar to the sharks similar to the lottery um and deal with the things that are in front of us um you know ferris still stands by the fact that he thinks he's worried of being bitten by a shark when he gets in the sea and i think that's stupid and i think that the same irrationality of thinking the world's going to end from covid19 again needs to go away and uh we're going to finish today with a q a so I actually put some questions out there for me to answer today. And I'm just going to go through some of them for maybe the last 10 minutes. I'm going to wrap this up and put this podcast out. Um, all right, let's have a look. Uh, Byron Bay. Yes, I'm seeing someone. Um, you'll find out as time goes along. Uh, let's have a look. Your adoption. Spoke about this in one of the Fair Points episodes. I uh, don't think there's that much else to talk about. If you've got something specific, make sure you ask then. Um, life after COVID, traveling, business, relationships. I think we've done that a bit. Um, let's have a look. Uh, 
how taking risks can pay off in life. You seem well qualified in this area. Well, you've always got to ask yourself that the worst thing I feel is looking back and thinking, what if? I know that sounds cliche, but I always thought to myself, you know, if it doesn't work out, I'll just move back in with my parents. And I know that's a very white privileged thing to say, but a lot of the time, if you take a, take a risk, you take a leap, you're only going to end up back in probably the place you're in at the moment. I've been saying this with Ferris as well. You know, he's got an eye for photography. I said, you should start a photography business. Just go for it. I said to him, like, you know, if it all went to shit, you'd probably end up getting a job in sales, which is what you're doing now. Um, okay, let's have a look. Approaching girls in the gym. I feel like a lot of knobheads ruin this for decent lads. You know, again, just say hello. Hi. You know, introduce yourself. Maybe see them again. Um, you know, it's probably not as bad as you think. I doubt they get spoken to that much. Um, all right, let's have a look. Here's an interesting one, actually. User aim says, would you interview Muslims and Christians about the universe? And actually, this was a bit of a heated debate we had at the beach the other day where, you know, I, I fully understand that religions have their purpose. Um, but, you know, if everyone's taking something from it, I don't understand why we can't all be on the same page. If you look at like dieting, right? One person does intermittent fasting, ultimately reduces their calories. Someone else does 5-2, reduces their calories. Someone calorie counts, reduces their calories. All these people have their different methods that they believe in that ultimately bring them the same goal. And again, if you've got Muslims, Christians, whoever, uh, you know, that ultimately all looking for the same goal of, you know, uh, understanding purpose, direction, how to live, morals, ethics, and all to them, we're splitting hairs with that. When we bring in science, the universe, and how old the universe is, and the fact that Adam and Eve couldn't approve, blah, 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 blah. Again, we're splitting hairs, and I don't think it's one of those things that's needing to be discussed, but we'll bring it up in fair points. Uh, Matt Nelga said, love to hear about a job you worked and you hated and how you went about changing. Yeah, I've uh, spent the early part of my life doing this, which is why uh, I feel so qualified to write Not a Life Coach as a book, because I say in the book, like, I started my 20s the complete wrong way, and I finished my 20s having one of the best lives in the world. Now, that could be me being biased, but I genuinely believe that. And I think a lot of people from the outside in, at 20, 21, I was knocking on doors, selling gas and electric for end power. I then went the route of fucking IT sales and recruitment. How many people in life have fucking started their life like that? You know, by the age of 23, I'd accomplished nothing. By the age of 30, I'd accomplished quite a lot. And what happened in between those kind of few years is exactly what the book's about because it wasn't calorie deficit it wasn't macronutrients it wasn't any of that that was my fitness journey but there was a big maturity and self-development journey that occurred between those two points as well and that's literally why I'd written the, the second book now I was following this blueprints of life where I had to get the job wear the suit put the tie on but I fucking hated all of these jobs and I thought that was normal and the reason I felt that was normal was because you look around and everyone else is fucking doing that they're all putting the fucking suit on, putting the tie on, complaining about work or fucking old Monday tomorrow, all of that. How I went about changing it was, you know, I kind of had these little midlife crises where I hated my job, moved to New Zealand to play rugby, came back, hated my job, went to Thailand and fucking Asia and Laos and Vietnam. Um, and then it, enough was enough when I hit 24 and I decided to become PT because I just wanted a job that I think I'd enjoy. And I really like fitness. And a few years later, I'm here. And if you look carefully, I went from being extrinsically motivated to being intrinsically motivated. And the amount of energy and passion and all those things that you see is, is pretty much because I was doing something that I wanted to do. Uh, Mikey Cod, favorite series right now. I'm watching The Man in the High Castle, which is really good. Uh, it's on Amazon Prime. It's about what the world would be like if the Nazis won the war. It's pretty cool. Uh, Shane of Three, Pursuit of Happiness. Again, I think it is about those not only motivators, intrinsic, 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 extrinsic, but at the same time values, again, massive part in the latter book, um, which you can pre-order now, by the way. Um, again, having values and determining what makes you happy. Uh, you know, a lot of people assume things will make them happy, falsely. One, fucking loads of people, you know, think it'll make them happy, don't think that's really going to get you a life of, you know, it'll be fun, don't get me wrong, but ultimately there aren't many people that are like, yeah, I fucked, 100, I fucked a thousand people, I'm well happy about it, you know, they're often lonely fucking losers. Um, again, a lot of people seem to think that being rich will make them happy, but again, they end up 
crying into a pile of cocaine in their mansion on their own and you know again they, they it's, it's a strange one the pursuit of happiness uh mark manson spoke recently about um marilyn manson about how he was depressed when he was 26 because he'd accomplished everything he wanted to in life and happiness is this really like, kind of strange thing that we shouldn't really be pursuing but instead asking ourselves what it is that makes us happy and that's very individual you know, some someone it might be being a great family man, to other people it might be being a provider or whatever it is. And we need to identify what our ethics and morals are and then our values. And we just need to ensure that we're walking the same walk as what we're what we're saying, what we're identifying. Because a lot of people are, you know, actually pursuing things they think will make them happy, like a six pack. Oh, I want a six pack will make me happy. Probably not, mate, because you'd be the same version of yourself who drinks less, eats less, exercises more, and is hungry more. You really think that's going to be a happy version of yourself? Pick carefully. Um, yeah, let's have a look. Have a quick look through the questions. Uh, the reason you're always riding Ferris so hard in the Fair Points podcast. I'll tell you why. Because he encapsulates the kind of people that we're trying to change, if I'm honest. Um, think of it this way. Even a lot of the advice that I've given today, I feel that Ferris needs to hear. Like, Sonny and I, Similar in the respect that, you know, we've got similar businesses, we've worked hard for it, we turned up every day for it. But ultimately, me and Sunny sit there very, very happy with what we do for a living. And every aspect of our life are very much that we change. But then, not riding Ferris hard in this one, we kind of feel that Ferris could be happier, doing something different, being more ambitious, you know, all of these things. So we're not riding him hard because it's not like we're doing it out of not liking them the same way that when I go in and people on social media or, you know, I say to someone, you know, or my clients over the years, pull your fucking finger out. It's not coming from a place of dislike. It's coming from a place of like, and, you know, a lot of people need to be kind of ridden quite hard to change. And, you know, probably Sonny and I feel that unless we really pressure Ferris to do it, you know, he's, he might not do it. And, you know, they say, there's that cheesy thing that diamonds are formed under pressure, but ultimately, you know, you really have to, have that kind of drive, that fire inside to want to change. Otherwise, you're just going to stay where you're at. And again, Albert Einstein said that the definition of insanity was doing the same thing and expecting a different result. And, you know, sometimes you want someone to change what they're doing, you have to do that. And, uh, you know, we, we're riding him because he's one of our boys, but at the same time, we just want to see him do better, I suppose. Uh, and he's an easy target. We'll put, we'll put that in the end. Um, cool. All right. Uh, going to wrap this one up. It's been a very enjoyable podcast, actually. We've spoken about quite a lot of things. It's been like, I'm going to try and do one of these maybe every Monday morning, like Monday morning catch up with Smithy. Um, again, like a lot of these things are tied into what I've written about in my second book, which I'm or I'm recording the audio of it in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you're on Audible and this is your first time getting an audio book, I'm pretty sure you can download it for free, the book, or pre-order it for free. Uh, there's links in my social media buyers to pre-order the book a few things if you like pre-order it on amazon you don't pay for it now because the more of you that, that pre-order it the cheaper it gets this is how amazon kind of keeps the market share of the book sales and uh you will only pay what the lowest price is so if everyone goes fucking crazy over the next few weeks and months pre-ordering it that price is just going to drop drop and probably most of you will be ending up paying like eight quid or nine quid uh for six months work from me and having it in a physical form i don't think that's too bad a lot of people have helped me uh, on the journey of writing this book, preparing the book, editing the book. So, you know, the pre-order for me is exactly the same as if you buy it on the day or the week or whatever when it comes out. But for all the people that put so much work into it and the event side of things and all of this, it'd be great for them to lead up to the release seeing those pre-orders. So for me, I don't always ask for a lot. Actually, I do always ask for a lot, but that would really, really help me out. Um, and in not like a sales pitch way, this is probably some of the best work I've ever produced, um, which is coming from my my critics, my peers, and my friends. So for that reason, I think you should check it out. Any of you that are interested in coming to one of the events, um, or getting tickets or anything like that, head to www.jamesmith.live. Thank you very much for listening. Hope you enjoyed it. As per usual, please do share these um, because some of your friends might not listen and this could be very helpful for them. So yeah, thank you very much for tuning in. Catch you lot in a bit. Bye-bye.